the best cards. Uh, I don't know how many of you were not at the workshop before. Can you raise your hand? So I don't know. Okay, so some of you. Because uh, before starting the workshop, we, I went through some of the slides. And uh, so I feel like now I give a full lecture uh, starting from, from scratch. Uh, the drawing, uh, the lecture title is Drawing Analogies. So there are two important concepts in this title. One is the concept of drawing, which is uh, what I consider the most universal language uh, to express thoughts, thinking. Uh, no other language is so clear to people, to children, to any kind of people. It doesn't matter which language they speak, they can understand uh, the language of Rome. Uh, at the same time, is uh, I think the tool more uh, useful for designers, for architects, to not only to understand reality, but to elaborate on their understanding, uh, to represent it, to communicate their ideas, but mostly to develop their ideas, to develop their uh, concept for the, for the work they want to put uh, ahead. At the same time, we have a word called analogy, which is uh, somehow a word uh, uh, that everybody knows more or less what it means uh, when we say this is a analogous to that, mean that it's similar, uh, it recalls something uh, of this uh, object into another object, of a situation into another situation. We tend to solve problems by using analogies. We say, well, this is a new problem, but I've done this before, and maybe even, even if it's different, there are some analogies with, with my past experience, so I may use that in order to solve the new problem. In uh, cognitive psychology, uh, one of the, uh, let's say, the, um, the tools that are used by uh, children psychologists, for example, to understand the development of a, of a child is to see if it's able to construct analogies, if it's able to solve problems by remembering what he knows and how to adapt his knowledge in order to do that. Uh, so, for example, if a child finds himself in front of a creek and he doesn't know how to go on the other side, well, maybe he remembers that there is a possibility of using a, a trunk to put on the creek and to walk on top. So maybe he has seen a bridge in his town and so he recreate the idea of the bridge that is seen in his town into the creek. So he's just using a lot of thing. Of course, for our scope, analogy is more limited to how we develop ideas to solve design problems. And more specifically, in this context, I'm talking about architectural and urban design problems. Uh, so, we are using what we call in-domain analogies, analogies that are connected to architecture. Architecture that resemble other architecture, urban design that resemble other urban design plans, and there is a development and the renovations, or constant renovation of ideas, which is nothing new, it's something that has always been used by architects, designers, especially when they are in the period of uh, uh, homogeneity of thoughts in terms of the spirit of time. So we can talk about Baroque architecture, we can talk about the classical architecture. But if, even those architectures, they refer sometimes uh, to very old uh, experiences. You know, the neoclassical, maybe you look back to the Romans and the Greek. But they don't copy exactly sometimes, they transform it slowly. 
into something else. So they're using logical thoughts. Um, the idea of drawing at the same time, to me, is something that is very much connected with the idea of thinking. So uh, the process of thinking is uh, it's very it's very weird. It's uh, it's not easy to to define what is the thought. But uh, at the same time, for example, in this case, this was the paper, the, the introduction of a book on my design work, mostly furniture and objects. And I thought, well, maybe I should write some work that had been inspired me during the course of the, the years, and somehow it is a sort of a self introduction to the to the work that I'm showing. So I put down words like shell, body, Leonardo, geometry, Matisse, Melotti, clay, proportion, Brunelleschi, Scarpa, Japan, mountains, coastline. You know, like a sort of brainstorming on these words. Then I said, well, maybe now I elaborate on this word and say something over. Then I say, well, wait a moment, let me draw those words. So I draw those words in the form of images, shells, body, proportion, Leonardo, Matisse, Clay, uh, Brunelleschi, uh, Japan, Scarpa, hills, clouds, time. And I realized that I was really developing a language, a language made of uh, drawing, like a, a, a written language, like a musical score. So this fact of developing a thinking process that could be uh, revealed by drawing, it, it, it intrigues me a lot. Because it's not just depicting something that is in front of me or copying something from a book or from a model. That, but it's really transferring your ideas into the process of thinking. Which is, of course, what the painters do most of the time. But sometimes the painters, they do more concentrating themselves on one concept, on one view, on one uh, element. While this is more of a writing, it's more of a, uh, a brainstorming uh, with yourself in the form of a uh, sort of uh, uh, yellow place, you know, or uh, shapes, geometries, uh, figures signs that they could be re-seen and re-read afterwards they were done. So I have developed all a series of uh, drawing like this, which I call uh, uh, notations or scores, because they have a, a similarity, an analogy with the musical scores. So something that develops in time and when you draw, you don't know exactly what was going to happen. It's like now, I'm talking, but I don't know exactly what I'm saying. I realize after I say something. Uh, and this is very good for the creative process. Just to say things, just to go ahead without thinking too much, without being too much analytical. But throwing words, throwing forms, throwing shapes there and then, realize if they are interesting, boring, useful, and so on. But this is the process that, the analogical process, has always been done in architecture by, I would say, hundreds percent of architects. Even those that they say, no, this building is like this because it came out from a scientific point of view, it can be different, it has to be this way. You know, this is often what the science think. But even scientists, they think by analogies, and some of them, they put a lot of their beliefs to what they are saying. Uh, Louis Kahn, you know, was drawing Roman cities. He went to Egypt, he went to the Acropolis in Athens. He was building up memories. He was building up shapes, form, images. And then when he got the occasion to design buildings, those memories came back. You know, the Richards Medical Building, it's clearly something that comes from the medieval towers of San Gimignano, and he, he, he recognized that, of course. Most of the architects they don't even recognize, maybe they, they even don't know about it. You know, this is also the issue. Maybe they even are not aware 
or where their ideas come from. Most of the time they come from the spirit of time and from the magazine they read and from the articles they meet and so on. But sometimes they come from uh, uh, more archetypal and more mysterious uh, source, sources. For that, Stigal Law is very much inspired by science, by diagrams, but even by music. For example, the Straco House, you say, is based on uh, the musical score of uh, Bartok, while he was listening to Bartok, he came this idea of uh, a house divided into uh, bass sound and light sound and all this type of differentiation that were making sort of levels or layers of the house. Uh, Australian architect Glenn Morgan inspired by vernacular architecture a lot. Uh, Dutch architect like your studio take a, a diagram from the science like the Moebius strip uh, to, to develop a plan for a building, for a house like the continuity of the circulation. Santiago Calatrava is inspired by uh, bio, biomorphic shapes, by the anatomy of the human body, by uh, bones of animals, and so on and so on. But most of the building that we see, or most of the architects, they don't work on one single analogy. They work on multiple analogies. I'm not sure what your Hudson was thinking when he was designing this building in, in Australia, but for sure he was very aware of the place, you know, the Bay of Sydney with the sailboat, with the ocean. He was very aware that he was making an opera house, so the sound was important. He was probably aware of many other things, maybe his memory of uh, German or Dutch or Danish architecture uh, and the history of, of art and Baroque architecture, whatever. The fact is that when we see a building like this, we don't recognize a single analogy. We think it's pure architecture. But at the same time, it brings memory of sails, of the shells, years of many, many things. So it's a multiple analogy that is implied in this kind of building. And it's the, let's say, the fascination that we have toward this building that we like it and we don't know exactly why. You know, but we like it because something comes to, in, our, in our perception that is not necessarily literal. So this is not a duck building, what Venturi would call, like a, a, I don't know, a hot dog stand that looked like an hot dog. Okay, that's a duck building, something that is a little dog and it does. But that stops there. When we get a building like this, the mind keeps going. We call it is an open work. It's open to interpretation. Now, I show the way I proceed in terms of design work by making a few examples of analogical thinking process applied to uh, design. For example, the human body, in my case, is very important because I think uh, we relate a lot of perception and like and dislike on the fact that we are aware of our body. Something that looks uh, no, unstable is because we know that if we are going in a certain direction, we become unstable. Something that has a front and the back, like a house, okay, has the front of the back, but the body has the front of the back. There is a rhythm that we may feel, uh, you know, in touch with because we have a rhythm in our body, the heartbeat, the way we walk and all these type of things. So our knowledge is first of all a, a sort of unconscious knowledge based on our experience from where we were in the womb, you know, up to, uh, you know, to, to our, uh, when we come home. So the human body somehow make to me uh, some uh, important uh, let me say, precedent for uh, developing uh, urban furniture. So these are pieces of furniture that I designed. 
but of course, every piece of furniture also recalls all the things. So if you do a lamp, it could be something that has to do with the flight. It could be something that has to do with the, uh, with the body that opens up, like an angel that flies and so on. But you see, but there is not any literal analogy in this sense. They are more like geometric analogies. They are more like perceptual analogies. And then certain shapes, they tend to recur, not only because they have a, a, a function. So this is the same curve of that, but this is, you know, to get this part of the body, the other one is to get the, the legs, and so on. This is movable, like uh, the legs that can move, and so on. Uh, so there is a sort of a sinusoid shape, but again, it could be related with the dune, with the wave, of the, of the ocean, or just uh, with the shape of, uh, of a body open, or a bird, and so on. So multiple analogies that goes on, which I have reused in other objects, like making this clock, in which the sun tells what time is it, and this moves during the day, and they say, this is the horizon, like if you were the horizon on the, on the, on the, on the ocean. So you know exactly not only what time is it, but you know where is the sun in that moment outside. So you know when is the sunrise, the sunset, and of course the horizon changes with the season. In the winter will be here, in the summer will be here. But you see, all these are uh, connections of the objects, which is not more just a clock to tell you what time is it, because to do that you can just have uh, two numbers for standard clock, but some connection with the natural time that is connected with the course of the sun, with the course of the light and darkness, uh, day and night, even the season is something connected with our perception of the time, so you get winter and summer and so on. So these are all analogical thinking that comes into the objects. So when, of course, there is no linear path of thoughts here. It's just everything is mixed up. But <clears throat> that brought me to develop a little bit more the research on this concept. So I wrote this book, The Architecture of Analogy, which is published also in the United States. It's called Analogy and Design. And it's a theory book. It's about uh, psychology. It's about uh, uh, architecture, design. It's about what are the favorite analogies of 15 architects and designers and they take every architect singularity. It's about the relationship between architecture and music, between architecture and literature, between architecture and visual arts, between architecture and land art, and all these type of connections that are always very, uh, they're always being uh, protagonists in the history of, uh, of the aesthetics in all fields. And finally, I did, this one is more theory, more written, and this is a, a book which is here, in fact, about how to apply some of this concept to develop uh, a drawing method. A drawing method in which there is a president, there is an analysis of the president, there is the development of this analysis into potential projects. So this is basically the core of the concept, the core of the lecture and the core of this book. Four-phase drawing method. We have a precedent in this case, it's a view of an historic town. But this precedent could be a plan, it could be a section, it could be something of a contemporary architect, of an old architect. Could be anything. It could be applied also in other fields, like industrial design. It could be applied to a graphic design. You could put as a president a bottle. You can put as a president a piece of paper. And, but then, when you have a piece of paper like this in front of you, uh, how do you go? You can think. And you can write, of course. Writing is a very important tool for everybody that wants to be creative. But at the same time, drawing is also a very important tool. So I concentrate on the idea of drawing 
and see how the president could bring to ideas and eventually that could be eventually used for design work. <clears throat> so, four phases, because if you want to draw, it's good that you learn how to draw a little bit, how to do a perspective, how to see shadows, how to follow a contour line. So you need a little training to do that. It's like for everything. You know, if you want to write, you have to learn a little bit how to write. Uh, the children learn how to speak naturally, but it takes years. But if the children also learn how to draw, eventually when they become eight or nine years old, they are they bend with the drawing because the teacher, they don't know how to draw, they don't like to teach how to draw. So the language doesn't develop, unless you go to an art school or so on. But anyway, this is an important part of the process because uh, it's like uh, to learn how to speak in order to, uh, to become, uh, I don't know, a politician. <laughs> if, you, if you don't know how to speak, I don't think you can become a good politician. And uh, the same is true, if you don't know how to draw a little bit, this process maybe doesn't work. But this is something that you do in school a lot. And you also do in school the analytical drawing, you know, when you do diagrams, you do axes, path, you analyze plans like you're doing right now uh, with uh, Michael. But also it's good because the analytical can be transformed into a subjective analysis, like we are doing subjective maps, for example how to draw a map from one place to another, how to make a collage of, 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 of elements and so on. So that is already still, I think, analytical, even if it's more creative, of course. I think it's also important the abstraction phase, because the abstraction means that you really look at this, but you go beyond that. You go beyond, you become a painter, you become a graphic designer, you become a, uh, I don't know, you, you shift gears from one speed to another speed, from one, you go from one road to another road. So, you are very free when you do abstractions. Imagine painters like Paul Klee or Mondrian or Albers, or, you know, they do abstractions based on different things. Some bodies more interested in the abstraction of color, like Rothko, for example somebody in the abstraction of uh, forms, somebody takes abstraction as a way to express his body uh, activities in a way like Pollock or people like this. But when you talk about architecture, you know, abstraction is a fundamental part of architecture because definitely uh, architecture is based on geometric shapes, it's based on, uh, on patterns, materials, and so on. So this, you know, out of this you can have thousands of different ways to make an abstraction drawing. In the workshop we show some of the ways, and, uh, and uh, I hope that uh, you didn't learn how to do abstraction, and I don't think this was the scope of the workshop, but the scope of the work was, was to open you some windows into activities that you can do it later on. Like, when you have your sketchbook and you go out in cities and you go to uh, Europe or New York or, or wherever you go, even in your backyard, somehow you don't use the sketchbook just to copy what is in front of you, which is this, which is good, and you have to learn it. But you use the sketchbook also to do this and possibly to do that. And that is what I feel is a, an exercise. It's not a project. It doesn't have to be beautiful. It doesn't have to be something extremely refined. It's an exercise of shifting from one level to another level. From uh, the objectivity of the view to the potential project. So, I say exercise because I make an analogy be between the uh, the activity of a designer and the activity of uh, somebody else, like an athlete, for example, that he has to, 
maybe somebody, I don't know, basket player or a runner, what it does, it doesn't just all the time try to put the ball in the basket, no. He goes to the gym, he work out on a certain muscle a day, another muscle another day, he eats properly certain things, he goes to sleep at a certain time, he is training in meditation, so he, he prepares himself for the game. These are preparation for the game, they are not the game. So they are exercises, of, they are working out exercises. And that's why they maintain this quality of sketching, of speed, of uh, getting things done without thinking too much about it. Like when you start to do like this with the, you know, with the weight to reinforce some muscle, you don't think too much, you just do that. But at the same time, observation, now I do a little bit of an introduction to get to the analogy. What we mean by observation drawing? What we put in our schedule? This, our observation drawing, even if they are slightly analytical, but they are mostly observation. There is nothing new in this drawing. There is a plan, there is a view of this lodger, Renaissance lodger, there is a view from the bottom up. So it's a sort of a also dynamic in that sense, it's analytical, but it's mostly just observe. You can do the same, I, I have a lecture called visual versus narrative. You can do exactly the same thing with words, writings. You can have observation writing, you can have analytical writing, you can have abstract writing, and you can have metaphorical writing, analogical or metaphorical often same work. This is another observation, like the landscape, uh, how the, uh, the monuments fit. This is an analytical drawing, but they are sketching, diagram, I use letters, you use words, you put down uh, the graphic symbols, arrows, uh, you break down the building into parts, you make exploded axonometrics and all this type of thing. So you have to be creative in seeing the image in making the building uh, communicated, let's say, to somebody else, but mostly to yourself. But they are analytical drawings. Abstraction drawings are like the paintings, I don't know, by Alvarado, uh, mostly inspired by uh, natural landscapes, or the first drawing that Led Daniel Lipstein was doing, uh, the shape, uh, contrast, they're, they're like painters. You know, in this case, they're not even architects, they're painters. This is the drawing I did in front of the pyramids, after drawing the pyramids, like this one, so that one, to me, is an abstraction. Analogy is a problem that it's, it's the, 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 the last step in this sense. So if there is a view like this that everybody may know or may not know, and so on, like the Spanish steps in Rome, and the analytical drawing is just done quickly, but there are elements that they won't be drawn unless they were seen before here. The axis, the thing that goes up, the, the cantilevered roof, slightly here, but exaggerated there. The, there are little canvas or tent that you see in front of shops that become more like uh, uh, real covers on the street, fountain. Anyway, these are, but even if you take a plan, it could be a source of analogical thinking, but also of analytical thinking, abstract thinking, and then you can come up with something like that. So out of the plan you can come up with an axonometric, but with different buildings. Now, I was explaining this most, uh, why we were doing this drawing today, that, of course, it depends also on the language that you are developing with time and years. I think this is very interesting when you go from something that is of a certain field, a certain region, a certain place, a certain age, into our time, into what we need to do now, when we are confronted with the project. 
excuse me. So, why not using uh, the technology that is available, like glass walls, if you want, uh, spans, that if you, if you, if you want to, to cover a space like this, for example. You know, without the concrete, it would have been a little bit different, of course, you could do with wood, but it's easier done with concrete. So the, the contemporariness of the, of the sketch, somehow it's what is interesting, that you go from something that is old or already done, experienced, into something that is somehow part of our time. This is a plan of a Florence Piazza Signoria with the Uffizi, uh, the Loggia, the Palazzo Vecchio, and these are little analytical sketches, you know, axes, corner movement, uh, features, abstraction sketches. And this is the house. So you say, oh, but the scale is totally different. Well, that's the point. Analogy doesn't, doesn't have rules. You know, you, you put the rules. You can go from uh, an object like this, with the idea that they developed an object like this, to a, I don't know, a, a mega building, or a, the form of a street. And in fact, we know many architects that do that, you know, especially nowadays. Or you shrink the scale. So this house, which I don't particularly like, actually, you know, but I put it there because it's a, it's an example of the this with this and the entry and the lodger. And so you enter from here and you have this view towards the swimming pool and you have a pergola or uh, something that with the shadow here and you have a little corner element here and the building has lodgers like the Palazzo Vecchio and so on. But also natural landscapes, forms, of course that could be the source of an analogy. And the analogy could be literal. So you do a roof that looks like a wave. Okay, it looks like a wave. Almost literally a wave. Or you may do a roof that recall the idea of a wave, but not necessarily a wave. Or the way, you know, this little village over there is repeated in a house there and so on. Or the view of a quarry in this case that became uh, an idea for a flight of stairs with different materials, uh, different way to go up, or a, you know, a forest, a pine tree, uh, wood forest that becomes a series of things. But see, I forgot to hear because in the book there is also a section called From Architect to Architect. So you can look at architect work, and this is what everybody does. Somebody used to do the Corbusier, they lost Frank Wright, Lord Louis Kahn, now in the Albert Zahadid, the Rand Colas, so this type of people. So you look at them, and then, but instead of waiting to have a project to do what they do, you can take a picture of their work and sketch on top and see how their work can be developed. But even if you don't like the, the, the architect, for example, this is the Robbie House in Chicago. This is an objective sketch, more or less, a little, a little diagrammatic. And these are two completely different interpretations. One is based mostly looking at the roof and the play of this cantilevered, the leaves, the shadows, and putting less emphasis on the mass of the building. So this type of thing. So this is that kind of interpretation. This is a totally opposite, I would say, interpretation, but it still comes from the Robin House, in which are in the masses that are the protagonist. Still, there is this sensation of uh, linearity and parallel plane shifted, shifting uh, volumes and so on. But you see, this demonstrates that analogy is not a style. So, again, you can learn a style 
And it's good to do that because sometimes you go to a professor that is very good at doing this and he wants you to do that because it's what he knows how to do it. And you learn how to do it in a good way. But I suggest that you also go to another professor which has another style. Maybe. And then you decide which is the style that you like. No, they don't have to decide for you. The analogical thinking takes another approach. It says, not against this, because I think this is necessary in schools, but it's also thing, this is also necessary to develop a thinking process that is not style, that is not ideology, that is not based on this is right, this is wrong, this is right, this is wrong, this is right, this is wrong. It's a thinking process that is based on the development of your own intuitions and the development of your own affinities and the development of your own potential. Because you will be much better in things that you like than in things that you have been taught to like. And this is also part of the, of the process. So, this is a drawing by Tessinov with this shifting facade, but beautiful way of going to the house. Beautiful drawing itself, you know. Whatever is beautiful sometimes inspires you. You know, if you go to banks, you want to throw every time, every, in every, every step you go in the city like banks, you want to throw. And it gives you an idea, if you think about it immediately. This is now case studies, urban views. Very simple, this is the tower of San Gemignano, like the one that Louis Kahn used for his buildings in Philadelphia. That is a sketch that I consider an abstraction. And this is the sketch which I consider an analogy. And these sketches, instead of being a square and a palazzo, this becomes a, a little house. Imagine that this person is this big. Well, this could be a house, this is the living room, this is the entry, this is a, uh, maybe a couple of bedrooms, one on top of the other. This is a sketch of uh, the monastery. The monastery are like little towns. They have a square, they have major square, smaller square, monument, houses, and other things. So it's a beautiful concept that could be redesigned to become whatever. A school, a hotel, a university. A, again, depending on the scale you give to this, it could even be a villa. And this would be a greenhouse. I don't know. So you see, the potential for seeing things. Now I show you a series of drawings that are done uh, on site, uh, mostly in Italy because that's where I live. And then I did either there or at the same time or afterwards, I did the analogical interpretations. This is Piazza Navona. And this is uh, Piazza Navona, but you see, the roundness of the dome becomes out here. This tower comes out here. The, like the facade of the church that becomes unified with the facade of, of the square. The cafes with their covers, you know, they are replaced here. The pattern on the streets and so on. So these are done very quickly, but of course they reflect my my likes, what I like to do as an architect. architect. I'll show you some houses I did. This is a little piece in Venice. Uh, just, uh, you know, you walk around this town and you find places like this in every corner. And this is an interpretation of much, much bigger scale. But there is a similar composition, a similar relationship between building, the river, the, the bridge, uh, the way that this is a little bit more elaborated, the path along the, the water, the going down to the water, you see like the little, little step here becomes a real stairway. This is Florence. So I'm not explaining all this, but you see for example the jagged the jagged form of that skyline uh, is reflected in the jagged form of the building here. 
the, the normal cantilevered heaves becomes a, a big uh, canopy. This is a drawing of Venice that I did years ago, and on top of that I did my analogical drawing. Something like this is classical. In the Romans used to do something similar. The Renaissance group, they replicated with clearly some interpretation in proportion, shapes, thinner. This is Bruno Desco. This is very interesting uh, view of uh, the square in Florence. And the analogical thing takes some ideas from here in terms of uh, the public feeling for this place becomes less public in terms it's less open but still uh, evident from the street because it's glass. The, the, the columns and the capitals and the arch, they are interpreted in, in those forms. Venice, again. Okay, these are different type of drawing. They are not views specific, but they are uh, drawing based on memories about path. And I think Michael has developed his drawing as well in his uh, books and his course. And uh, in this case, there are paths in the city of Florence. These are large drawings like this, which I did, I guess, 25 years ago. I was in my studio and I said, okay, let's go out for a walk, or maybe let's Let's draw the walk. So I started to draw a little bit of plan, and then out of the plan, the perspective, and then out of perspective, say, oh, what if I am here? What do I see? Or what if I go there? I open up and do this. Or, you see, it's like a, 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 a video sequence in which you are far, then you get closer, then you get closer. So you can draw this. More, you can do something like this with a video, or even with pictures. But then you have to put them together. The process becomes a little bit more uh, intricate and long. The drawing allows you to do this immediately. I can do this drawing in, uh, in this big in half an hour, just by walking and remembering where I'm going. And I'm sure you can do the same drawing if you think about, I am in this class, so now I'll put a drawing from this point, this moment, to when I will be in my living room, in my house. You will go out, then what I see, is that a plane, then I take, uh, I don't know, the bus, or I take my car, and then I go, and then I have a street, I have a landscape, I have this. So it's a, it's a subjective map, in the sense that it recalls your own memories. Like this. You see, this thing is very small and this is very big, but of course the proportion, the real proportion are a little different. This is in the reality is red, but I, I don't know, I remember I just put it, let's put it blue, let's see what happens. See, if I start to think, oh, should I put blue, should I put red, should I put blue, should I put red? It doesn't work. You have to put something there. Maybe you throw it away if you don't like it, but you don't have, I think. I say all this, you do, you don't, but uh, please don't take it that way. <laughs> I, I should say, I don't do, I don't, I, I, and so on. Uh, you see, this is not red, but then I say, well, I like this color. The fact that they're different, and that's what a lot of painters did. Matisse, uh, Braque, uh, but even El Greco, I don't know, or Contormo in the Renaissance. They use different colors than they used to be the natural colors. These are all the views. I, I put it there because it was left. It was a mistake when I was doing the PowerPoint. <laughs> I found myself with this picture in this one big. Okay, let's put it big. Let's make it small. So this doesn't mean that you can use computer to develop these ideas. It's not against computers at all. This. It's again something that has to do with the thinking process and developing the tools that allow the thinking process to proceed. If you are very good at computer, I'm sure you can use analogical thinking for computer drawings. 
This is the same view from the same point here. See the, the plane of Piazza Signoria in Florence? I did a plane here. Then I did a little bit of a, an area of perspective. Then I say, what if I'm here and I look there? What happens? I draw that. What if I turn my view here? But here there is a tower. So what if I look up? I see this. See, so in the same drawing, you have this multiple views. This multiple. Again, nothing new because painters have done this before. This is an interpretation on a, a perception, perceptive map, excuse me, subjective map, with an analogical urban plan. Okay, now the last part of the lecture is dedicated to uh, four projects that I developed and somehow I see these relationships between the idea that came out during the project and uh, the analogy that were used to develop this project. Of course, this is not, it's not been a linear process. When you get a project, let's say somebody calls you up and say, I want you to design my house. Okay, first of all, you have to meet, you have to know what they want. What, then you go and visit the site and you get ideas from the site. Then you want to know how much they want to spend and then you have to limit your thing. Then you have to read the codes and then you get to shape the house according to some of the codes. And keep going and going and going, then you have to talk and then you have the codes and then you have to cut things. So the, the, the design process is a mess. It's not linear. It's not like in the school. It's not like here that you've got a project and you develop it at least to the linear phase and nobody tells you about it except for the teacher. No, you get hundreds of different inputs, feedbacks, changes and so on. But there is always some ideas that are in the background and for the scope of this research and analogy I show some of the major ideas that somehow shape these projects. So one is a project of a house in San Francisco that I did about 10 years ago. And it's a single family but quite large, about 1,000 square feet. One is a, an art center which was the winning project for a competition in Los Angeles but it was never built. One is a, a, an exposition pavilion and one is another house recently built in, uh, in Italy. For these three projects, I take one specific major analogy. For the last project, I say this is a multiple analogies. For the house in San Francisco, Japanese architecture was very, very good. I had books open in my desk. I had discussion with the client. I lived in California for 10 years, so I know a little bit about you know, the feeling for a certain type of architecture, the landscape, and so on. But let's go one at a time. This was a house facing the beach on the Bay of San Francisco. It's called Tiburon House because the place is Tiburon. And when I say, oh, I have a great occasion to design a building in San Francisco or this nearby, well, immediately I thought about the barns in the countryside of California. I thought about the modernist houses built in Los Angeles and San Francisco in the 50s, 60s, the case studies houses, which are Neutra. Schindler, Eames, all these people. But also one, the only request of the client was that they wanted some kind of courtyard or some, some interior open space. So I thought about the, the courtyard of the Roman villas. But then at the end I thought, well, wait a moment, all these are great and there will be analogies for sure that will come in. But I wanted really, I was in love with this Japanese architecture type of things because I thought it was very much applicable to 
to the site. You know, wood, like in California, uh, connection with the Eastern culture, very strong. The clients were interested in that. The idea of courtyards and the connection between nature and in, an interior space. And also the simplicity, you know, all of these very simple right angles. Somebody say, oh, but nature doesn't have right angle. Okay, okay. You know, this is another subject of discussion because I think that nature is something that is in our mind in the first place. So it's how you interpret nature that is natural, not natural in itself. And so I came up with a plan with a courtyard, but it's not a courtyard, it's a garden. And the center of the plan is a void. It's something that doesn't exist. Or it's not a volume, it's not something solid. It's, it's void. Around that void, we have four pavilions, you know, in the shape uh, of a spin wheel, with a, a guest pavilion, uh, service, bedroom, master bedrooms, living rooms, and a garden in the center that works also as a, as a gallery space. But then I was looking at this Katsura Palace, and, uh, and I was struck by these images of the land, the, the building that follows the land. It's not like flying on top of the land, which would have been a beautiful building anyway, I'm not saying that, but I wanted to follow that end. Uh, the stepping that is in plan but is also in elevations. So this idea of the step made me to do these sketches and come up with this stepping house, three steps, on one floor only, even if it would be two floors. But I thought it was less impact on the landscape if it was just a low house. And there was not much more to see than from the ground floor. So you see the house steps down towards the beach. And even I design all the lights, light fixtures, a lot of furniture. Even the, the elements somehow reflect this idea of the stepping. When I was looking, oh, I had the roof. I had a model made with clay of these blocks. And I remember a friend of mine, a very good critic, art critic, architect critic. And I asked him, what would you do in the roof? And immediately he said, oh, it has to be flat roof. It has to be flat roof. See, this to me is great. Beautiful flat roofs. There's a lot of flat roofs. But it's a little bit ideology. It's like you say, you want to do a modern house? It has to be flat. Said, no, I don't want to do a modern house. I want to do a house. And I thought that the California climate, the California tradition, this idea could have be a nicer roof that were not so flat. So I proposed to the client sloping roof copper. But these drawings, you know, come from the president. They are not really abstraction, they are more analytical. And the roof are all this plane of shapes in the landscape, very low, and actually they work also well with the solar collector. Then there is the idea of the garden and the Katsura Palace and all these courtyards. But here I was much more inspired maybe by the Italian clusters and the clear rhythm that you have in the columns, in the space, and the height, the proportion. So all the idea of proportion is always very important. But again, this sensation of flowing space between inside and outside Horizontality as a major line that defines this sense of participation with the landscape also came up again in different light fixtures, screens, movable screens, and so on. This is the view from the back when you arrive to the house. See, for example, this is the entry door. When you enter, you open toward this view of the, of the bay, of the water, and this is the public path to the living room. But I had to design a, you know, a light to lead the entry. And I did the, exactly the plan of the house, the, the spin wheel. So 
the object, the small and the big, they dialogue. They, they somehow get one inspired by the other. In this case, the small was inspired by the big. But it could be the opposite. This is this gallery that works also, in fact, as an art gallery around the, the major thing. And this, I want this to be radiators because I design radiators for the houses all the time. But they want the, 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 the heating under the floor. So this, because this is facing south, they work perfectly as a screen, light screen. And again, this oriental, Californian, European mixture of elements and when you arrive to the end of the house. Okay, this is the other project. Is, uh, the precedent is that it's a monastery. It could be any monastery, of course, but I was very familiar with this one, which is in Florence. They have a part which is more public where relatives and people go here and they meet the monk. The monk lives in the back part here in the cells. And then they have a lot of common spaces for dining, cloisters, and so on. So there was this hierarchy very interesting. And this is the view of the monastery with this rhythm, repetitive rhythm and monumental element. And this is the project I developed for the, for the, for the competition. The sequence of entering, the, the public part is the library, the shop, the galleries, and the major court, and the more private part in the back with the laboratories and the classrooms. So again, the steps and this, but again, there are many different analogies or metaphors with California architecture. I call this a path in the woods, but it was like going to uh, a wood with the light coming through the wood trellis and so on. But the monastery was still the major, the major interpretation. I told you, I won the competition, but after years and years, they decided not to, not to do this project, they remodeled the existing art, 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 art center. This is the case of an installation, a temporary installation for a show. This is a town in Tuscany. It's a medieval town with a lot of towers. This is the city hall. Actually, I did a show here about Leonardo da Vinci, but this is not the case. Of, uh, the, the mayor say, I want to make a show of all the work that is going on in the city, all the projects, the urban plans, the architecture, the construction, blah, blah, blah. Say, I want to do it in this palazzo because this is where it's supposed to be the most prestigious palazzo. But I asked, what is this sh the show for? Who, who, is, who is for the show? For the artists? For... No, 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 it's for the people to know this, uh, this project, for the citizens. So, well, I don't know, if you do it, something here, probably not many people will go there because it's, you have to go in, you have to go up, it will be closed, you know, you don't... You know, I got this idea, and I went, and they showed it this little sketch. And say, why don't we do a pavilion in the middle of the square, at the end of a major course of path, for people, they walk. They will see this, it's a sign, it's something that, like a tower. But it's not a medieval tower, it's a contemporary tower. There is this tree that somehow brings them inside, so they can keep sprawling, but at the same time they will see all this project. So there is this double function of being a sign and of working as, a, as an element uh, present all the time, not just during the day, but even at night. You see that maybe you could close it at night, but at least the people see this and they can come back. So this to me was a, it's a true analogical thinking process. This is the last project I show you. It's a house on the coast, near the coast of Tuscany. This is the view from the land, from the house, the Tyrrhenian Sea, the Mediterranean Sea. And you see the landscape is very soft, it's very classical, it's very serene, as you say. Ah, 
so this horizontality of the landscape, you know, I think should have been brought into the house. But at the same time, I didn't want to do a modern house in the sense of something you've never seen before or something like that. No. To me, the house should have been something with the roots in the culture of the land, in the tradition. At the same time, being contemporary. So again, like in the analogical drawing, something that has not a specific time in itself, but somehow it takes from everything that is part of the place. Of course, the concept of place is very important. So I wanted to conceive the house as a set of geological strata, so that there was a part which was more linked to the earth, to the ground, maybe the same color of the ground, the same material of the ground, or at least uh, of, the, of the, the stone that was quarried nearby. The second part, which was more related to the idea of the ocean, I wouldn't call it ocean, but the sea, and therefore the Mediterranean house, which has been of inspiration for many architects, the Corbusier and so many others. And another part, which was a little bit more like a sheep, like if the house were flowing on top of these hills, they were like waves. So this metaphor or analogies came up in some drawings, but mostly they came up in the, the process of designing the quarry. And these are twofold stone, is volcanic stone of villages like within half an hour from the house. The Mediterranean house has a long tradition of beautiful buildings such as this, the Malparti house in Capri, with the steps. And the ships in itself is a beautiful piece of architecture in terms of functional uh, materiality and so on. So these three layers somehow were the, uh, the, 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 major, the major narrative for the house. So these are sketches done during the process of designing this level. Of course, the landscape, it's not just made of views, but it's also sky, it's also clouds. So you want to, you know, to frame also the sky, you want to frame the, you know, the, the view of the oceans. But not necessarily always use the word frame, you know, it can be done in many different ways. But also the real sequence. There is always this process of how to get to your to your building. And that sequence starts maybe kilometers or miles before you get to the building. You know, the moment you drive in, you drive away, where you park the car, how you walk, how you arrive, what do you see? So this is part of the architecture process. So this is the house, and again, it's not, this is not that big house, but uh, you have living room, excuse me, bedroom, two bedroom here, and a major master bedroom here, living room, dining room here, uh, another bedroom there, and you arrive here like this, and then when you get there, you see the landscape behind it. You have seen the picture of the Mediterranean house of Malapark in Capri, you know, this idea of the steps. So this is all material I got in the vicinity of the house. Travertino stones, uh, stucco, uh, volcanic, and this part is more metal, like a sheet. And all the outside metal is galvanized steel, all the inside metal is copper or brass. So when you get to that point, then you see the sea there, and then you get this sensation of a double view of the water. And I designed all the table, the radiators, the lamp. This was done by the plumber. I did the house. The, the radiator was done by the local plumber in the small village. And they, they were very excited to do different things. Then you go down to the underground part, partially underground, and you have more radiators, 
then you lamps, copper. And this is the view from the back. When you arrive here, this is the view. So you see this nautical form. So of course I had the fortune of not being under the art commission. You know, just behind that hill I could have had to deal with the art commission to the people there. there right. So I had more to deal with just the local building department that allowed the design and I could do that. And this is the setting in the in the landscape. So this is the last slide, but I wanted to finish with the larger score. Again, sort of thinking, uh, uh, thinking expression through sign, gesture, informal things. Then they become bodies. They become little landscape uh, memories. Uh, spaces uh, and still you know there is always something that somehow go back to the idea of body space nature and this strong relationship which I thought that through analogical thinking and uh, through the medium of drawing can be developed and eventually put to use for, uh, for the project that I've done
to know a lot of things in my hospital that maybe a normal architect wouldn't do. But you know, I I don't I, I don't have the lecture on my work because I've done a lot of interiors and I've done a lot of objects and I've done a lot of graphic design and I've done a lot of this and I've never seen a gap between the disciplines. Then we can of course discuss because it's not so simple question. But it's a good it's a good point. Mean a reference a precedent? A reference for yourself. As you keep working through these sketches, how do you create a reference of how you work personally? I don't understand the question. What do you mean a reference? Uh, a reference for the process. How do you know what you know that you know what you're doing? How do I know what you know that you know what you're doing? That's better. <laughs> Things. 
And then at the end, most of this work, if I were listening to people saying, oh, but this doesn't work, oh, but this it doesn't make sense, oh, but this is uh, stuff, or this is not good, why don't, don't show this drawing, show this drawing, don't do this, you know, stop that sometimes, say, wait a moment, I'm doing this drawing because I, no, or, well, why don't you just do abstract drawing, just do abstract drawing, if you want to do galleries, if you want to sell your work, abstract drawing. Come on, yeah, I'm not doing abstract. I'm doing drawing, and I like to draw because then they become abstract. <laughs> but this marketing, fashion, trends, uh, whatever, I think are the worst word that you can think of. So, uh, I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit, of course, because I know it's important marketing. <laughs> you want to work and you know have success and everything, but we give too much importance. That uh, probably doesn't answer your question. <laughs> Thank you. I really enjoyed the lecture. I'm curious to know, um, in your answer to the first question, you said that your work kind of spans from objects yeah. and interiors to architecture. Do you think that is um, something that is part of your generation of Italian architects? Um, but do you think it's also supported by the analogous method um, that you yeah. use in your design? Well, definitely it's part also of my generation in the good and the bad, of course, because when I was studying architecture in Florence, it was 68 to 74. I did one project in five years. One. I know you were good. But, <laughs> but we studied art. We were into politics. We traveled. We stayed five months uh, in South America on the beach. We were uh, uh, involved in developing our ideas about what to learn, not just taking from the program from the students from the thing and so on. So it was a great training in terms of being propositive. Of course, it was a bad training in terms of professional <coughs> work. And that's why after I graduated, I felt the necessity to keep studying. I went to England first with Professor Tom Cole in the same school, <laughs> Architecture Association. And then I came to the United States University of Pennsylvania with a, with a scholarship for a master. And then, because I wanted to design, even if my thesis was about autonomous house, was about ecology, was about solar energy, but all stuff that it was a design, but it was a design almost technical and very political. To me, it was technical and political together. When I went to work in San Francisco for uh, an office specialized in uh, sustainable design, they were great in terms of organizing conference, thinking process, philosophy, but they were not much interested in real design. They were very much looking at sustainability. And then I felt a little bit, well, architecture is more than that. It's not just that. Now there are many offices that have mixed these things. But at that time it was still too ideological, you know? If you are sustainable design, just you know we do row of houses facing south. Okay, facing what? Facing south. Okay, but what? <laughs> what do they see from that? <laughs> south, you know what I mean? Or, so and that's why I, I had some time, some problem working with other people in that sense, because uh, I find sometimes a little bit too ideology, too much, too much uh, linear thinking. You know, I have to get there. But my point is, you never go as far away as when you don't know where you are going, in a way. You, know, you have to experiment, you have to go beyond that. Again, I forgot your question, so... <laughs> Scale. So seeing it all together. Right, so at the same time, you know, because uh, 
the architecture of school in Florence, and this was there. I had to take exams, even if my way, into industrial design, urban planning, preservation, <coughs> urban design, uh, plastic art. So we were all the same thing in the same schools in the same five years. Then we decided most of the things we wanted to do, but also we had great teachers, you know, even big people and so on. So, and that I think it gave me more, uh, uh, more uh, um, familiarity with different fields because the school was a little bit open to all these different fields. I don't know, nowadays, depending a lot of on the schools, of course, I mean, things are changing, but it's, it's good. Things have to change, you know, it can be always the same. Uh, Actually, uh, Andrea has a vigorous engagement. He has to attend in Georgetown in actually in half an hour. So I have to kind of wrap it up. I just want to say thank you for being with us today for the amazing lecture.